Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are now in Paul's letter to the church, to the believers in Ephesus. The letter itself is entitled Ephesians. And uh, I believe this is the second devotion. We have not gotten too far into the, uh, into the letter. But uh, here we are, and we're going to start with chapter 1 and, and get into it. So I invite you to take a moment and pray with me, and we'll uh, go into Paul's letter. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the various people that you have called through the millennia. Those who uh, were very human, very much like us. Not perfect, not even close, but called nonetheless. Failed multiple times as you were teaching them how to live in trust, live in love, love for you, trust for you. And so we pray that in the same way that you have used the various saints and authors of your book, of your scripture, that you speak to us today, that we too can understand that we are called to the same faith by the same Spirit, with the same power that you empowered your first disciples. And this we thank you for and praise you for in Jesus' name. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. To the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to emphasize that greeting because as he starts out this letter, and he's not just writing a a friendly letter, he's writing a letter, although it's friendly hopefully in nature, but he's writing a letter to give them instruction. He's writing a letter to give them direction and insight and to um, speak in a manner that conveys spiritual authority. Not a suggestion, but an authoritative letter to those that share in his faith. And that's why he says an apostle, meaning someone who's called out, to go out. Apostle, apo, is the Greek word to mean from, so so it means sent. A disciple is someone who is learning a discipline. And in that regard, all of us are disciples. You cannot be a follower of Christ, if you will, or a believer and not practice discipleship. They're, they're, they're coupled together. They're one and the same. Although in our culture, discipleship has been um, very much uh, neglected and, um, and is not the forefront. In fact, in our culture, it's not uncommon for people to think that you can be a believer and not a disciple. But in, in the case in terms of just using words, the wording that's used in the New Testament, Being an apostle means that you are not only a disciple learning the spiritual disciplines and learning how to live in the kingdom of God and growing in that ability, but you're also sent by God for a mission. And he, in this case, Paul, writes that he is an apostle sent by and on behalf of Christ Jesus by God's will. Now, the the, the people that he's writing to know his reputation. They know his, if you will, God story. Paul was not an original disciple called by Christ when Christ ministered in human form. When the word of God was incarnate and God came into this world in the form of a man, Jesus the Messiah, Paul did not, was not part of that group. Paul became a disciple, an apostle, by way of spiritual discipleship, spiritual revelation, supernatural revelation that took place in the spiritual realm while he was actually en route to a city, Damascus, to persecute, to kill, and to imprison those who called on the name of Jesus Christ. So it's a 180-degree turnaround for Paul, and with the same zeal, with the same 
level of passion and determination that Paul spent in adhering to Judaic law and enforcing Judaic law and persecuting those who did not follow Judaic law, he now put that in to going and building up the church of Jesus Christ. Very powerful, authoritative statement for Paul to make by God's will. So this is how he starts the letter. To the faithful saints, now please do not think of saints as being a group of people or an individual who somehow has this moral quality that's far superior than everybody else. It's not based on moral superiority. It's based on God's calling and God's calling alone. And faith, meaning faithfulness to the one God, is what is required. Now, there's going to be a moral component, of course, because one cannot follow the living God and act in ways that are destructive to God's purposes. But it's not a moral standard that qualifies one as being a, sta- a saint. It's faithfulness to the living God. So he calls them saints, wherever they may be in their walk. Maybe they've been believers for decades. Maybe they've been believers for a few months or a few years. But no matter where they are in that journey, they are saints. And he calls them as such. So to the saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He addresses almost every single letter with the phrase grace to you and peace. And that and there's a a deliberate intention of doing that because grace is the foundational gift that accompanies faith. And most people don't really understand what grace is and so it's important to under to, to at least have an overall understanding. First of all, I know for myself growing up in church, I was taught that grace was God's unmerited favor, and it is. That is definitely what grace is. God's love and God's favor, unmerited, meaning you don't work for it. It comes from his nature. However, that alone does not tell you what grace does. Grace, in addition to being God's unmerited favor is also God's power working on your behalf to accomplish what we could never even hope to accomplish on our own. Grace is not something that humanity needs because of the fall of humanity, the entrance of sin that we read in Genesis 3. Grace is something that humanity was originally intended to work from, from the get-go. In other words, humanity was never given, especially when you read, say, Genesis 1.26, let us create human beings in our image and, and our likeness and let them have dominion or let them rule, let them have responsibility over the fish of the air and the ber- fish, rather, and the birds of the air and over the wild animals and the livestock and all those that crawl on the ground. That mandate, if you will, that purpose, that spiritual purpose to reign with God in this world was not meant to be fulfilled outside of grace. We were not ever designed nor intended to carry out living our lives and the responsibilities thereof without grace. We need the power of God working on our behalf to do what we can not do on our own. Unfortunately, those who are very skilled and have various skill sets in in the world today can can forget that and rely on their gifts that God's given them more than grace. But grace is, is, is key because once we enter into the kingdom of God through faith, we have access, if you will, to this grace. And because we no longer have to carry the burden on our own, there is a peace that goes with us based on the fact that we have access now and live from God's grace, God's power working on our behalf to do what we cannot do. 
Well, that brings us then to verse 3, which we'll pick up next time. Until then, may the grace of God be with you, and may you grow in your understanding and awareness of His grace and your trust in His grace. So that when you are exhausted and when you are tired, when you are confused, when you are overburdened, you don't have to take that on yourself, but you can rest in assurance knowing that his grace is sufficient for you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to talking next time as we go into the, the uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. Until then, grace be to you. Bye-bye.